seen in the tech cloud with the uh, terms now used for how are children affected, some of you typed they are at risk to become a lost generation. And it's against this background that we are having our conference today because our ambition as cities, as national governments, as civil society has to be to prevent children from, from becoming the hardest hit victims of the pandemic to become a lost generation. That's what we are talking about today, how cities prevent children to become victims like this and how we all can support the work on the ground to make children uh, not a lost generation, but a happy and a prosperous yeah, generation. Uh, prosperous generation. We have uh, a we have, crowd uh, gathered today, crowd more than 150 people 150 from 40 people. cities, from 40 22 cities. European countries. We have members of the European Parliament, of the European Commission. We have Commission. representatives from national governments and, and ministries here. We have civil society representatives. So it's really a good group of people that is prepared to discuss this important topic. And that's why I also don't want to spend too much time talking myself. It's an online conference, as always in these times. You know the rules about muting yourself. You know the chat. You can type in questions or comments there, and we will take it up from there. So you can actively participate in this conference. And that's actually our invitation to you to do so very actively. And apart from that, I want to give over to our co-host, because we're very happy to co-host this event with Brando Benife, member of the European Parliament. I think you have been one of the youngest members of European Parliament when you started your term, Brando, and, and you have been working with the Youth Guarantee. So you have been working on the topic and also on the question of the Child Guarantee. You're the spokesperson for this topic of the European Parliament. So I'm happy to hand over to you to open our conference, please. I think you have to unmute yourself. Yes, OK, sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize I was still mute. Um, thank you very much for uh, uh, this uh, opportunity. Uh, dear uh, colleagues and participants, uh, let me start. Uh, by uh, thanking Eurocities for having organized today's discussion and for having asked me to be the co-host. It's a great pleasure and a privilege for me to be here and to discuss what I consider a major political achievement of this legislature, the creation of the Child Guarantee. As you know well, it has been a key objective of our political family, the SND Group, which progressively managed to gather the support of the whole European Parliament, in particular in the context of the European Social Fund Plus, um, therefore uh, bringing this uh, point, the child guarantee as a key uh, red line in the MFF negotiations uh, also with the, with the Council and the, and the Commission. Today we can say proudly that the child guarantee is a reality, a new program that will commit all member states to invest in policies to tackle child poverty in its multidimensional aspects, which means a new European strategy to ensure that all children have equal access to quality healthcare, childcare, education, housing, and adequate nutrition. Parliament and Council re recently agreed on the legal text of the new ESF Plus regulation, also thanks to the work of the Portuguese presidency today represented also in this debate, which uh, uh, I want to salute and thank for uh, the uh, availability in uh, working constructively for this important objective, but also for being here for uh, a keynote uh, speech in the event. Uh, we also have a great deal of gratitude for the work of the European Commission, in particular uh, Commissioner Schmidt, for his decisive push in getting a final deal done and for having positioned the Commission side by side with Parliament's demand. A tailor-made EU, EU program to fight child poverty, a sadly growing phenomenon in Europe, even before the dramatic impact of the pandemic. I grasp this opportunity to thank uh, the cabinet of the Commission and especially Santina Bertulesi that has been our constant contact uh, and also for contributing also to this uh, uh, debate and for the help on the dossier. 
Uh, however, this result could not be possible without the involvement of a true uh, ecosystem of actors from the civil society. NGOs, trade unions, as well as regional and local governments, especially from cities' administrations that started pushing and calling for our proposal of a child guarantee uh, to, be, to become a reality since uh, the moment where we placed it on the table. A broad and continuous advocacy campaign that proved to be essential in the achievement of this result. Today, we wish to hear from them, listen to their experiences, and indeed learn from their local practices. I cannot think of a better moment indeed to have this exchange among us, in the very moment in which policy is being shaped. In fact, the child guarantee will be a first and crucial building block for putting into practice the European pillar of social rights. The involvement of local and regional actors, including the public authorities as well as the civil society, will be indispensable to map out adequately the local needs and ensure a proper implementation, because we know that this is the, the issue after we uh, enact a legislation or a budget piece. A recent study published by Eurocities, in fact, which will be presented in detail today, provided crucial data to the ongoing political debate, proving how complex and nuanced is the situation of children and their families in the urban context. This means that even in those countries that apparently have nationwide relatively low figures for brackets at risk of poverty and social exclusion, the AROPE, uh, indicator, nevertheless, significant and worrisome pockets of child poverty still exist at city and regional level and therefore must be addressed by programming adequate resources for their eradication. It's a task for all member states and for these reasons we need a far-reaching European plan to address it. This has always been the, appro the approach that steered the action of the Parliament's negotiating team. We have always insisted and obtained to clarify in the legal text of the ESF Plus that all member states must have the obligation to implement with adequate resources the upcoming child guarantee. A new Council recommendation establishing uh, uh, the European child guarantee is now in the making and we call on the Commission and the Council to be ambitious based on what we obtained with the negotiations of the ESF uh, Plus on the matter of the child guarantee. We want this document to become the policy blueprint for the investment in children's policy in the EU in the upcoming seven years, a structural measure to prevent the child poverty problem of today and to develop uh, um, uh, society and economy of the EU in the future, uh, fighting against social exclusion and promoting education, youth employment, and also the health uh, dimension. It's essential that child guarantee will be fully geared into national early childhood education and care policies and investments, but we also need a complete and synergic alignment with the EU policy and investment framework, in particular by making the best use of the national recovery strategies in our national recovery plans and also in the context of the European semester. It's very important that this goes on together. I conclude here my opening remarks by thanking you all for being here today and by welcoming all our esteemed speakers, starting from uh, our uh, youngest boys, uh, Lanre Adelei, a member of Youth Parliament and Youth Council for, Le for Leeds, and of course all of our speakers, they will present themselves, Annette Christian Scavuzzo, Sal Marif, Santiago Saura e Alex Cerin. And finally, also my colleague, Pagos Pizarro, whom I also thank for his extraordinary work in the recovery and resilient facility regulation uh, that is extremely important for this to become reality, all what we discussed, uh, we will discuss today, and for his continuous efforts in the issue of child children's rights also in the intergroup. I now leave the floor uh, to Annette Christie, Vice Chair of Eurocities Social Affairs Forum and Councillor of Glasgow City Council, for her uh, presentation of the Eurocities study I mentioned earlier in my speech. Uh, let's have a fruitful discussion and thanks again for asking me to be the cost of such an important and timely um, uh, debate in this crucial moment of our European uh, 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 work uh, together. Thank you very much. Yeah, you did already my job. Uh, so I was waiting now for Annette. Okay, you're preparing to get up. So thanks for setting the 
context, Brando, for the political context with the upcoming uh, proposal of the Commission for the EU Child Guarantee. That's exactly the thing we had in perspective by uh, setting up this meeting today. And also thanks for setting the um, content context uh, that we want to start from understanding what child poverty means. And that's exactly the background of the study Eurocity Eurocities conducted on fighting child poverty in European cities. And that should inform our debate. The outcome of this study will show us what's happening on the ground. What is actually child poverty? What does it mean? And what do cities do to fight it? And that's where I'm very happy that Annette Christie from uh, the Glasgow City Council and also Vice Chair of the Eurocities Social Affairs Forum is with us and prepared to give us some insights from this report. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning to you all, members of the European Parliament, representatives of the European Commission, fellow, fellow city representatives, representatives and friends. It is my immense pleasure to meet with you all today, digitally, of course, as all events are now. These past 12 months have been very challenging for all of us as individuals, um, as well as city administrators and policy makers. But above all, during these times, it has been extremely challenging for families with children. Those who have to juggle between work and family, homeschooling, caring responsibilities, all while dealing with the same stress and pressures that we all do through the pandemic. The longer this crisis lasts, the clearer it becomes that there's a devastating impact on our children, an increasing digital divide, deepening inequalities, and an impact on their mental health and overall well-being. As more parents are losing their sources of income, child poverty is increasing and our social services are stretched with an unprecedented increase in demand for support from families with children. So I'm here today to share with you um, not just these very worrying trends that we see in our cities every day now, but also some of the local solutions already tested that can inspire us all. And perhaps we can join forces and do our best to reduce child poverty in Europe and improve our children's lives. Uh, my colleague Bianca will be helping with some of the slides and the findings that we found from the, the Euro uh, Cities report. So, um, uh, if Bianca is able to load some of the slides. In late 2020, Eurocities conducted a study to examine the local situation of child poverty in our cities. Data was collected and analysed from 35 cities across 20 European countries. And what we found is indeed worrying. Um, so let me share with you firstly three key findings. So firstly, uh, child poverty is higher in cities, sometimes double or triple the national average. Now, this is due to higher living costs in our cities, especially the housing costs that are, as we know, increasing year by year to, due to a shortage of affordable housing in cities. Now, to give some examples, in Brussels, the child poverty rate is 40%, while the national average for Belgium is under 20%. Malmö's rate is 25.5%, which is three times higher than the average in Sweden, and Rotterdam's child poverty rate is more than double that of the Dutch national average. A second finding from the report was that there's a strong territorial dimension to child poverty. Children living in the most deprived areas face from a three to ten times higher risk of poverty than those children in the more well-off areas. It's nothing new yeah, yeah. that with mm -hmm. increasing housing prices, families on lower incomes will move to cheaper urban areas, resulting in large disparities huh? between different parts That's of the city. That's what kind of city. director of studies. In Amsterdam, for example, the child poverty rate is 8% in the city centre, but 26% in the less well-off southeast district, while in Ghent it stands at just 1.5% in wealthy areas, but 31% in the poorest districts. Now, our third finding, child poverty is in fact family poverty. It's not enough to focus on children in isolation from their parents, but support for the whole family is needed to break the intergenerational cycle of poverty. Improving the situation of children very much depends on improving the situation of the whole family. 
be it getting out of debt or helping parents to get a job with fair pay, a real living wage as we promote in Glasgow, or making sure their home is heated, renovated up to a good standard and connected to the internet. So that is why many cities take on a holistic approach to address child poverty by giving support to the whole family. Now, our study has found that many cities already deliver local strategies to tackle this problem, but often the city's efforts are not well known, recognised or supported at national and EU levels. In fact, three quarters of cities already have in place either a dedicated child poverty strategy or a broader anti-poverty strategy, which does include child poverty. And some cities are, of course, in the process of setting up these strategies. So what do all those cities have in common? Again, three more things. Number one, a systemic approach to tackling, tackling child poverty by improving the situation of the whole family. As I've just said, improving access to affordable housing, employment, decent income for parents. Number two, every city strives to improve access to childcare and preschool as a key to reducing inequalities and providing equal opportunity to every child is starting education at a very early age. Number three, an integrated approach to working in local partnership, connecting all services and organisations who work with children, from childcare, schools, to social and family services, health and sports providers, NGOs, all those seeking to identify risks early on and design measures targeted to specific local needs. Now, many cities are piloting innovative approaches to tackle child poverty and focus on place-based policies to close the gaps in access to services and opportunities for children in deprived areas. In Glasgow, we have an initiative called Thriving Places. Now, this is a 10-year commitment where the City Council works with other public agencies, third sector organisations and local stakeholders using principles of co-production to identify local assets to build capacity and social capital in our most deprived neighbourhoods and thus empowering communities, hopefully. Now, Thriving Places seeks to combat inequalities and to invest in the most local assets, be that buildings, land, organisations or the people themselves, the aim being to create resilient, sustainable communities in Glasgow that are stable and creating the conditions for dynamic and thriving places where people are proud to live. Now, fighting child poverty is a priority for most, if not all, of our city councils. Our cities are investing many resources from their municipal budgets to reduce child poverty. A report has highlighted cities like Ljubljana, who spend nearly a third of their city budget on childcare and school education. In Glasgow, this is something we also prioritise through the main budgeting process, but also with additional funding for special projects. Like many cities, we've identified that feeding your family over the school holidays is a very real worry for many parents. In Glasgow, our children's holiday food programme, developed in 2018, sees an investment of over £2 million every year to target children's holiday hunger, where people just cannot afford or do not have access to nutritious food during school holidays. Now, this programme has not only helped to alleviate food poverty, but it also reduces the stigma around those who suffer from it, because this programme is inclusive to all the city's children. It's delivered by third sector partners where child activity programmes are offered as well as a healthy meal to attract all school aged children. So it's universal, building equality and strong relationships within our community. I'm sure all our cities are committed to step up their efforts. And to date, 18 cities have signed city pledges to reduce child poverty as part of the Euro Cities campaign, Inclusive Cities for All, committing over £6 billion to support children in need. Ghent, for example, committed to invest more than €570 million Euros in tackling child poverty at the municipal level. Warsaw pledged to double the number of childcare places in the city and it actually achieved it in under two years from a commitment they made in 2019. We're all committed to doing more to fight child poverty, but we do need more resources. And with the pandemic and the resulting crises, cities are facing an increasing demand for aid 
but our municipal budgets are shrinking. And so our city's resources are no longer sufficient and need to be complemented by higher social investment in children from national and EU budgets, possibly through national recovery plans and the European Social Fund Plus. So to conclude, our data from cities shows that every country, region, every city has pockets of child poverty. Not addressing this now will only deepen those pockets of poverty and burst the lost opportunities for children, leading to higher and higher social polarisation, possibly distrust in government and authorities for do not doing more to prevent this, to prevent the lost generation. The EU child guarantee should bring all levels of government together to work on an integrated strategy to reduce child poverty and step up policy action and social investment in children to close, close the gap in access to service. It is vital to make those services more locally available to where the children live, as close to home as possible and integrating service. And this requires a serious investment in local social infrastructure, especially in the deprived areas. For the EU child guarantee to make a real difference for children in need, it should firstly be localised and support the step up of local packs for children, like local partnerships, connecting all services and actors, working with children in an integrated local plan to fight child poverty and bridge the gaps in access to services. Secondly, it should increase social investment in our children, by allocating sufficient resources from EU and national budgets to children, allowing use of the resources where needed at the most local level and encouraging innovative approaches. And thirdly, cities must be involved as key partners in developing and delivering the child guarantee at all stages, ensuring a multi-level government with joint responsibility and coordinated strategies between local, national and EU levels. Colleagues, we can build a better future for our children if and only if we work together and join forces. Thank you. Thank you, Annette, very much for this overview and these insights. The full report is available for those of you who haven't yet read it. Uh, the, the link you find in the chat, also the link to the Eurocities recommendations for the EU child guarantee. And also, if you're interested in finding out more about those 18 pledges of cities related to child work, and they are all on the website Inclusive Cities for All, which is also the hashtag of this meeting. So if you are tweeting, which we of course hope you will, use this hashtag Inclusive Cities for, with a number, as you can see in the chat as well, for all and uh, at Eurocities to make sure people see it. We will follow up on some of the things you just said, Annette, in, in our conference today. For example, on Ljubljana, uh, the, the city that allocated a third of its city budget to childcare and education, so we will hear more from them quickly. But before we go there, we want to go and listen to one guy who is closer at age than most of us to the group of people we are talking about. We are talking about young people, children and young people. And I'm very happy we have one, not a child anymore, Lanre, of course, uh, yeah. but 17 years, uh, still young enough compared with most of us here. Uh, you've been participating in a BBC documentary called Project 17, because you are just 17 uh, and still are, as I understand. Uh, as of last week, I wasn't. I'm 18 now, actually. You're 18 already. Okay, so uh, welcome to the club of grown-ups. <laughs> but still, compared to most of our participants today, including myself, very uh, much closer to the age group we are talking about. So let's take the opportunity and, and hear it fresh from you uh, what we are talking about. And, and maybe you could tell us a bit about how you personally and your family were affected by the situation. We are 12 months now into the pandemic that has affected all of our lives. How was it for you and your family? I mean, for me um, personally, it's more to do with like education and because we've been at home and um, education like at home is kind of hard for those people who um, live in like deprived areas. And for me, it's kind of just not having like not being in school and um, like kind of 
losing progress of where I was before, like the pandemic kind of hit, before I was able to like do my, my assignments and probably like in time and now. Um, and then during the pandemic, I was like behind like three, four months than most people in my lessons. And that was just like kind of, I don't, I don't like, yeah, it's kind of, it was hard because it's, I know I want to kind of do well, but it was just being at home um, wasn't, you know, it just wasn't great. Um, and kind of, yeah. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the keywords that was also mentioned in the cloud when we just started the call where people said, what does it mean? Exclusion was one of the of the big terms uh, coming out there in, in this workload. So if you're excluded from social interaction, from meeting friends and, and from uh, being there where things happen, that's of course a, a big thing that affects your life. How did if at all, the municipality help you in that situation? Was there any support you got? Yeah, um, so because um, the Youth Council, um, they meet regularly, um, like we did weekly and bi-weekly sessions, depending on what we're doing. And I think it was just kind of good to be able to see like the same people every week where like normally uh, you wouldn't be able to see uh, many people um, as what you're used to in school. Um, so being able to like participate in youth council activities like during that time was like extremely helpful. Yeah, that is because you're a, an active member of the youth parliament and the youth council in Leeds. So you have been before and, and you were able to still connect with that. But that is of course also part of your uh, your personal vita. What, what do you think that maybe others who are not already engaged in such a way and connected in, in such a way, what would they need most from what you know to as support from, uh, from the municipality? I mean, if I listed all of them, I think we'd be here all day. Um, but I feel we kind of do need to like level the playing field. Um, like I've been fortunate. I go to a school in like North Leeds, which is um, like better off in terms of like wealth. Um, but before I went to a school in East Leeds, which is one of the most deprived areas in the country, I believe, and people who went to schools um, to my old school, many of them are without um, devices. So the digital divide was quite prevalent and school teachers would um, like they did their best to physically go to these houses and drop physical work for them so they weren't left behind. So I just do feel like we need to level the playing field for everyone um, in everywhere, basically, because so many people are um, so many people are there's a there's a lot of, there's a gap between um, the wealth and people who are like at the bottom of society and kind of like poorer in society. So I do feel there are so many stuff we can do, but it's just making sure that opportunities are there for everyone. Yeah, I, I think we are all agreeing that this gap has been deepened or widened by the pandemic because it has uh, increased uh, inequalities in, in this time. But they have been there before and we know that they exist and we know we have to bridge the gap and we have to overcome those inequalities. That's what we are here for to discuss how best to do it. What would be your advice to city leaders as gathered here today, both in the UK, but also uh, all over Europe, what they should do and prioritize to fight child poverty also beyond the pandemic? I do feel um, they do need to work with people, uh, with like young people um, who are from like deprived areas. And also um, like there are quite a few things depending on like the level, if you're talking about cities or um, government level. So like cities um, could definitely be trying to work with um, young people. I know um, whilst I was doing the Project 17 podcast um, with the BBC, I went to a place called Catch um, in Hare Hills and they do like fantastic stuff trying to make sure um, that young people are catered for and trying to make sure that they're not being left behind. And I do feel it's important that we kind of encourage people from like our background to be able to aspire to be um, change makers in government level, because you see that um, most people in government are, um, they've probably come from places like Eton College and rich private schools. I do feel you need to encourage people from lower class areas to aim to be a part of these societies. And then from government levels, I do feel it's giving funding to lo local councils because without the money, they can't really do, they can't really help um, people who are um, in child poverty and in poverty in general. 
So I feel that's just like one of many things that they could do. And I remember speaking to Philip Olston, who was a special rapporteur for the UN, um, and he said po poverty was a political choice. And um, what I got from that is that um, he, governments know that they can end stuff like this. I just feel it's actively trying to. Um, so, yeah, I think, yeah. Thanks a lot, Lamre. I mean, that was the perfect summary of our motto, inclusive cities for all. Uh, I think that's exactly what it means. And uh, thanks a lot for your work, for being with us today. If you're uh, happy to share the good example that you just mentioned also in the chat, we are always keen to see good examples from other cities. So the one that you just mentioned that you saw there, if you have any information that is maybe available online, please uh, share it in the chat or after the call with us if possible. Sure. We would like also to distribute those good practices in a way that they can be copied in other cities. Yeah, no worries. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot for being with us. Very, very interesting and inspiring. It's, uh, there's future uh, and hope for the future. We can see that. Thanks a lot. Let's go to one of the cities now that has been mentioned before, Ljubljana, uh, dedicating one third of its budget to childcare and education, and also committing itself to one of those city pledges that uh, Annette has mentioned in her overview as well. Uh, and I am happy to welcome Alice Cherin, the deputy mayor of Ljubljana. Um, Alice, let's talk about the pledge that your city makes. And maybe you could explain a bit first about the situation in Ljubljana. What is the most pressing challenge in your city that children are facing? Hello. Uh, nice day from Ljubljana. To you Thank and you. all participants. Thanks to the city's supportive policies, more than uh, 13,000, that's uh, unbelievable, unbelievable uh, 96 persons of children, uh, children attend uh, kindergarten. The public education, education system can minimize differences between children from very different social background. We aim to keep our kindergartens accessible to everyone, regardless of uh, them social, ethnic or other uh, background. In the last 14 years, we have added 3,000 new placements in kindergarten, kindergarten and 6,000 in primary schools. That's a 30% increase compared to 2006. Furthermore, we subsidize costs for children and preschool for families with Low, uh, with low uh, income level and uh, ensured free holiday uh, care after after school activities and uh, school lunches for children from uh, uh, disadvantaged uh, background. We are strongly in favor of public education to help minimize differences between children from very different social background. Therefore, we focus on founding an edu education network of public kindergartens and on quality investment and uh, maintenance. The public system is supplemented by private kindergartens, which offer specially pedagogical programs such as uh, Montessori and uh, Waldorf. Uh, an important challenge is including, including children with special needs, children of foreign origin, children from Romani families, and from socially 
marginalized groups in uh, in general. The city sup supports teacher training and uh, involvement of specialized teachers to help these children when they enter the education uh, system. During the first lockdown, the schools are the schools and kindergartens were completely shut down. Many children were suddenly left without a hot meal, but drivers volunteered, volunteered in distribute food through the city between 10 and 20 volunteers uh, would uh, deliver up to 500 lunch, uh, lunches per day. During the second lockdown, the schools have been closed down again. While a remote education is hard to most children, it is so much the harder for children with mild and severe disabilities. The closure means they have not been able to attend therapies and uh, treatment they normally would have. Teachers in schools and the city counseling center are preparing special program which will be help children, teenagers and parents uh, when they return to the school. Thank you very much, Alice. That's an impressive overview, both of the situation, the pressing situation in Ljubljana, and also the commitment of the city and then what you are able to offer and what you already have achieved. Maybe you could briefly tell us about your future plans. So what is Ljubljana focusing on in the future? What will you do? And also, what would you need from the European level? What kind of support do you need from, for example, the EU Child Guarantee? Um, attract funding for infrastructure for children with special needs in kindergarten, kindergarten and schools and on playgrounds funding for job counseling for young adults with special needs. We aim to further support for education staff working with children with special needs, especially children on the autism spectrum. We would also like to sec secure more funding to support teachers who help children on the autism spectrum when their children uh, transition from uh, kindergarten to school. We see a lot of opportunities in UA funding, of course, direct participation of lo local government in the funding system is a session is uh, essential. Yes. Thank you very much, Alice, uh, for these insights in your work in Ljubljana and also your recommendations that you are uh, expressing here. Uh, all the best for your future work. We're really um, impressed by what you're doing. Thanks a lot for the pledge that you have been committing to. It's an inspiration for others again. It's pledge number 18 on child care that we have in our a portfolio and it's another inspiring and very impressive example. It's a big commitment your city puts there. I mean, one third of the budget dedicated to this uh, speaks for itself, but also what you explained with your priorities to even looking for those in special need, for those with disabilities, for as also one of the participants uh, was highlighting in the chat for on Roma children. So. Even when we talk about child poverty, we see different groups of people, of, of children with special needs there who need special care and special attention. Very impressive to see what Ljubljana is doing to also support them. Thanks a lot for this. Thank you. We're in the 
Portuguese presidency in the EU in the first half of this year. And Portugal has expressed the ambition to focus on social issues. Porto will host a social summit in May, uh, one of the highlights under the Portuguese presidency. And we are very honored and delighted today to have the Secretary of State for Social uh, from Portugal with us today, Gabriel Bastos. And I'm very happy to hand over the floor to you for your keynote speech, please. Um, thank you very much. Uh, good morning uh, to all of you. Um, thank you, uh, dear Ivo Banek. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, I begin by thanking uh, AeroCities uh, for the invitation to participate in this digital high-level conference dedicated to uh, the EU Child Guarantee. Uh, I also um, thank the European Parliament uh, and uh, Brando Benifei for all the work done uh, regarding uh, children's rights. We are facing uh, one of the biggest challenges of our history, combat combating an invisible enemy, the pandemic uh, COVID-19, and uh, saving as many lives as we possibly can. The persistence of uh, poverty and unemployment and its foreseeable uh, increase due to, 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 to the crisis uh, will impact families and children and require global and integrated solutions. Within this uh, context, all of us uh, have to have a, a specific role to play. Regions, uh, cities, of course, member states must join forces and act uh, together. We cannot risk an overturn in what we have accomplished. We need to ensure that uh, child rights are respected and that we can contain the negative effects uh, on the well-being and potential uh, of our children. We must keep a solid and ambitious agenda and work individually and collectively to pursue our objectives. It is uh, the only way to overcome the challenges we are facing and win this battle. We need to invest in, in the economic future uh, of the EU, uh, as it is crucial to secure the well-being uh, of all children in Europe. Bringing children's needs to the center stage uh, is not uh, just an imperative, but also the right choice, the only choice for building a brighter future for all of us. This means focusing more of our energies and resources on Europe's most valuable assets, 100 million children living in Europe, representing more than 20% of EU population. Uh, as the running uh, presidency uh, of the EU Council, we, have, uh, uh, we will place children's rights at the forefront of our political agenda and commit uh, to reach an agreement that allows for the adoption of a child guarantee recommendation announced already by the Commission. I know that the European Parliament pushed really hard for this and deserves uh, our recognition. The Child Guarantee aims at ensuring that all children in Europe who are at risk of poverty, social exclu exclusion, uh, or are otherwise disadvantaged, uh, uh, have ac access to essential services of good quality. It is important that all member states commit to invest and develop strategies and action plans to ensure that children in need have access to free or uh, affordable uh, services such as education including uh, early childhood education and care health care nutrition and housing uh, culture and the leisure activities combating child poverty and break the cycle of poverty uh, to ensure uh, equality of uh, opportunities and support uh, children well-being is vital for Europe. This requi requires uh, strong 
broad and comprehensive approaches involving all levels of government and addressing cross-sectorial concerns. Let me very briefly share some of the work Portugal has been doing. We adopted uh, recently a strategy for children's rights for the period of 2021 to 2024, and we are now preparing its uh, action plan. This, the strategy was built around five priority areas promoting well-being and equal opportunities for all children and young people, supporting families and parenting, promoting access to information and uh, participation for children and young people, preventing and combating violence uh, against children and young people, and finally promoting the production of tools uh, and scientific knowledge to enhance a global vision uh, of children and uh, young people's rights. It is in these uh, uh, areas that we will focus our activities and we'll embrace cooperation with uh, other stakeholders, including the academic community. At the European level, the dice are rolled. The ambition is great. This is the time to go further. This is the time to leave no one behind. This is the time to put the generation that holds our future in the forefront of the national and European political agenda. We join our voices and efforts to your own. Let's build concrete advances on this field and commit ourselves to put children first. Portugal will do everything to accomplish this uh, ambition. I end my intervention by quoting the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, for every child, every right. I wish you a very good uh, working session and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Gabriel. It's great to see that Portugal puts so much emphasis on social issues and especially on childcare and children's rights. That also makes the ambition time plan for the planned EU child guarantee, because uh, I think the um, people gathered today represent very well what is behind this. It was an initiative from the European Parliament, and we are co-hosting this uh, conference together. It was picked up by the current commission uh, that is going to make a proposal in two weeks from now, and then the uh, Portuguese uh, EU presidency will bring it up, hopefully at the social summit in May, which is an ambition, ambitious time plan to have all member states uh, adopting it. It will not be a new legislation, it's a recommendation, but it's still a very strong commitment and it's a political signal that emphasizes what we have been talking about. I uh, very much like when you said, uh, let's think about children are our future. So we're not talking about one special group somewhere in a corner that needs attention or so. We are talking about our future. So it must be at the core of what we are doing. And it's great to see that these things are moving forward. And I would like to invite a panel of people that can explore a bit further on what the EU child guarantee needs to be and also what it can provide, how it can support the work on the ground. And I would like to introduce our panelists. One you have already met at the beginning, Brando Benife, our co-host today, member of the European Parliament, and another member of the Parliament, Dragos Pislahu, who is also the vice chair of the Intergroup on Children's Rights. And then from the Commission, from the Cabinet of, of Commissioner Nicola Schmidt, the Commissioner for Jobs and Social Rights, Santina Bertolesi. So maybe we can get a bit of a sneak preview on what will be presented in two weeks. Let's see how much you can disclose. And we also have some of the city representatives that are gathered today on the panel. We have Anna Scavuzzo, the Vice Mayor for Social Cohesion in Milan. We have Salma Arif, the Deputy Executive Member for Children and Families in the Council of Leeds. And we have Santiago Saura, 
the Councillor for Internationalization and Cooperation in Madrid. And I would very much like to start with the city representatives, actually. I mean, we have today followed a bit this approach of looking what's happening on the ground first by visiting our report and the findings and insights, but talking to one young guy from Leeds, uh, Lannes, who triggered a lot of positive comments here in the chat. So we see it's always inspiring to engage directly with young people. It's not something we should talk about, but to engage in and, and to really include. So that was a very nice uh, opening for our call here. And now we want to take a look at the reality on the ground in those cities and then connect it to what Europe at large can do to support the work there. And maybe let's start with Milan and uh, with you, Anna, um, about the situation in, in your city. Can you tell us a bit what you do to reduce child poverty in Milan? Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks to Eurocities for inviting also the municipality of Milan to this event and also to give us the chance of focusing our attention on what we are doing in the past and what we are going to do also in the future. It's very engaging for us, it's very interesting and challenges for nowadays in this crisis moment, but also thinking about the future. I was looking forward to share uh, with you the central role of cities on these issues and on Milan in a special uh, way uh, because we uh, want to give a pragmatical approach to this, uh, uh, to this issue. Uh, I think that first of all it's fundamental the approach. I think it's important the sentence, the African sentence that says it takes a village to raise a child. So first of all we have to stress the role of educational community. And in this period, it's very important to work together, to focus attention together from different point of view on these issues, on every issues, and in particular on children issues, because it's a topic of everyone, not just uh, a, a, an issue for those who are in charge of children. I would like to stress three um, concrete local examples examples from the Milanese context. First of all, a, a project called Primi Passi, First Steps, and it's a project aimed to fight the educational poverty. It has been realized in a multicultural district of our city in order to implement a pedagogical model shared at local level among early childhood education and care services, NGOs, and the entire educational community. So a, a very important stress on this approach with the educational community. And for example, we had activity on psychomotor worship, pet therapy inside and outside schools, open days for vulnerable families, multidisciplinary trainings, group of parents, and a very important peer-to-peer -peer approach. Second example, uh, in the framework of our food policy, we had a lot of activities dedicated to children, and I choose just one. I can speak a lot about food policy and children, but I focus attention just in one. That is a new activity we are going to open, uh, because we are going to open a local food waste hub with focus on children needs. So a hub dedicated to, to child poverty in order to strengthen the, the capacity of our city to answer in the proper way to children's need. The municipality holds the governance of this entire process, a sort of B2B process. Municipalities are working with enterprises and with community and association in charge for children, and then they uh, give us uh, ideas about needs and we give to them response and support and they can deal with families. Last not least, a project called Wish Me, Wellbeing Integrated System, a project funded by Urban Innovation Innovative Action Program. And because the well-being of children is at the center of the city policies, as I mentioned before, and we have a lot of activities. 
First of all, a strategic framework shared among different city departments, citizens and NGOs, a method of work. We work together, not just uh, everyone in his field. Second, gaming platform for children, young people and families with cultural, leisure activities and sport through a voucher system in order to ensure accessibility for everyone. And it's very important the direct participation of children and family, creating new spaces, languages and focuses on children's talents. It's very important that families feel that they are not alone and they are not dealing with their children alone. So first of all, every project has this important approach on the community and every project as a community of people and uh, different agencies together with families. Thank you very much, Anna. I understand that you take sort of an integrated approach also to, to watch uh, on territorial poverty. And we heard before child poverty is family poverty. So you have to address the whole family. And uh, it's very interesting to hear how you integrate services locally to really find what's needed at this specific local place or in, in this region and to join forces there. Very inspiring. Thanks a lot. Let's go to Leeds. We have been to Leeds already with Landre, your young colleague from the Youth Council of the city, Salma. Uh, so you're working with the city and you have a sort of a child poverty strategy called thriving, uh, which is a very positive term. So it's nice to hear that <clears throat> you, you found a way to express it positively. So what are you doing to make children thrive? Well, first of all, uh, Ivor, thank you very much and good morning. I probably won't be as great as uh, my fellow citizen, Lan Ray, uh, but I will try my best to follow up from him. But it was really a pleasure uh, for me for me as, as a Leeds City Councillor to, to listen to what Lan Ray had to say. And particularly, it, it's really important we listen to what our children have to say. We can sit and say, this is important, that's important. But ultimately, the key has to be we need to ask our children. So really proud of, of Lan Ray. So, so Ivor... Our ambition in Leeds is to be the best city in the UK for children and young people to grow up in. The approach to child poverty in Leeds is particularly innovative. Thriving the city's child poverty strategy focuses on creating partnerships between all the relevant local actors who work with children to foster joint responsibility and shared ownership to address issues that impact child poverty. The partnerships are made up of children and young people, council directorates, schools and third sector, private sector, public sector and community representatives. Now, these partnerships use their knowledge, expertise to investigate the impact of poverty on a specific area of children's lives and then work together to create projects that mitigate the impact of poverty. The strategy in Leeds seeks to use recent research to improve policies and projects to develop the most effective, low-cost, high-impact solutions to improving the lives of children in poverty. The work is coordinated by the Child Poverty Impact Board, which is a city-wide partnership working on measures to reduce the negative impact of child poverty through using evidence-based interventions. In addition to this, Ivor, we've got six impact work streams uh, involving a wide range of partners across the uh, city, work to improve um, in, in children's lives in six different areas. That's health and well-being, employment, learning, housing, and empowering families and financial inclusion. Just to give you a couple of examples, the, city, the area that I represent is a place called Hare Hills, um, which is a very deprived uh, part of, of the city, but actually across the country. Um, what the council has done is here is we've um, introduced something called selective licensing. Um, the housing in this area is, is um, terraced housing and we have poor accommodation. We have um, housing that has um, effectively, um, unfortunately, not in the best of standard for children. So by creating selective licensing in Hare Hills, another area in Leeds called Beeston, what that does is it gives us the opportunity to go into those housing and look at uh, housing conditions, look at overcrowded properties. And, and that's a key thing because we need to make sure that children have adequate housing. And, and just like Glasgow, um, we also have healthy holidays. 
uh, which effectively creates it's a program that offers meals and activities for thousands of children um, to make sure that they are healthy and happy. So and you also said on those local partnerships, as we heard from Milan, and I, think, and I just read in the chat a, a beautiful sentence, it takes a village to raise a child. And that's exactly the idea behind joining forces with all in the community uh, to support children. Thanks a lot for that, uh, Salma. Uh, let's go to Madrid, uh, Santiago. Um, your city has been hit hard during the pandemic. Others have been hit hard as well, Milan uh, and so on. But Madrid, you have been uh, suffering a lot. So we will be keen to hear how this has affected especially children and their families and what you and the city could do so, to support them. Yes, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning to all. It's a pleasure to, to be here today. Thanks for, for inviting the city of Madrid to participate in the event. As you have said, uh, Madrid has been hit hard by, by the pandemic, like uh, also like other large cities in, in Europe, which has uh, resulted in a strong health, uh, economic and social crisis. Uh, we, we have developed a study here in the city of Madrid on the impact of the pandemic on families with data as of October 2020. And the study shows that a third of the households have experienced a reduction in income Income due to the pandemic. This figure is higher, significantly higher for families with children. 42% of them have experienced reduction in income and this grows up to 46% for single parent families. Therefore, uh, the risk of, of, poverty, of poverty, particularly for, for, for these families with children, and the need for support have increased largely uh, due to the pandemic. We have in addition, use the, the available data from social services, combining them with geolocation digital tools to especially identify where in the city there is a greater need for support, which is significantly concentrated in a specific deprived neighborhoods of, of the city. To help uh, all these families, we have responded to the emergency by first distributing baskets with food and all the basic products directly to these vulnerable families with children, as well as direct financial aid for them, with a total of 30 million euros from March to December 2020. We have reached in this period uh, 85,000 families, which is more than four times more than a normal year. It was only 20,000 families in, nine, in 2019. So we have reached in these pandemic times uh, last year about 255 uh, people during, during this pandemic period. Even more strategic uh, has been the launch, the recent launch by the end of uh, last year of uh, the family card uh, for food aid uh, with a budget of 20, 20 million euro for this year, new year, and that puts priority on families with children. This family card is similar to a, to a bank card that you can use in any food shop. So it's, it's a non-stigmatizing response is a modern flexible response for each family to use and adapt to their needs they can use as i said in any food establishment in the city the amount that we charge to this card range from from 125 to 630 euros per month depending on the number of family members giving a greater weight to children and by mid-february we have already distributed more than 6,000 cards uh, to families and this number will continue growing in the next weeks. So these are examples of, of important measures that we have taken in these pandemic times that amount to more than 50 additional million euros from food baskets and the family card uh, in addition to, to the ordinary uh, services and resources. And of course these measures are supported by a wider, more comprehensive set of resources and services that are provided by the social services of the Madrid City Council that have been also uh, reinforced during during this pandemic. Thank you very much, Santiago. We see some common threads here, like there are hot spots in cities, deprived areas, uh, regions that are affected more when the needs are concentrated, and so also support needs to be concentrated there. And then also the strategy of acting together, of building local partnerships to address the needs in a 
holistic way and then to join forces on this. So some specialities in our cities represented here, of course, every city is different, but also some common experiences and similarities in the approaches. So maybe we could take this to the European level, since we are talking about a European initiative, the EU Child Guarantee, to see how these two levels can be connected. And maybe before we, in the end, uh, learn from the Commission what is coming in two weeks, uh, let's maybe hear from the Parliament, the driving force behind the EU Child Guarantee. What do you think, Brando, hearing these city examples, the approaches that have been described here, what do you think cities and local authorities uh, should have as a role seen from the perspective of the planned EU child guarantee? What is the role of cities and, and city leaders in your view from, from the European perspective? Blando, you're still with us? Maybe disconnected for a moment. Okay, we have another uh, MEP, Dragos Pislaru, with us. Maybe I could uh, invite you, Dragos, to uh, respond to the same question because it would go to you as well anyhow. So I, I plan to start with Blando, but maybe you could start. And No, uh, I'm here. I'm ah, here. Ah, there you are. Uh, Sorry, sorry. I had to to move for a moment, but I hear you. <laughs> um, oh, good. Yes. Let us so let what, us know what you think about what you just heard from cities. Yeah. Uh, that is the local level that has been yeah. described yeah. here so far. Yeah. So when you yeah. connect it with the planned EU child guarantee from your European yeah. perspective, how do you connect those things? What yeah. is the role of cities in in the EU child guarantee? Yeah. Well, I think we heard very uh, different experiences and we heard uh, you also underlined it, uh, uh, the, the phrase that uh, uh, Deputy Mayor Anna Scavuzzo that I know and I want to salute uh, in this occasion, uh, the expression regarding the, 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 the takes a village, no? For a child, it's, it's, it's a representative, we can say, of what... Uh, of the challenges, because we heard the different uh, context also, but uh, uh, we um, we know that the city's uh, 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 role will be extremely uh, uh, relevant uh, uh, because of what I was also saying at the beginning, that in the end we have written, we have written and voted uh, budgetary uh, provisions uh, on, in the ESF Plus, and uh, uh, we fought so that uh, all the member states, including the ones, uh, also some that are here in this uh, panel, that, that uh, have a, a, a general better uh, condition in terms of, uh, of uh, child poverty, will be anyway due to look into uh, the um, pockets of child poverty that we we have also in the best uh, situations and where we have been very clear from the parliament side we don't think it there is a level of acceptable child poverty um, we, we we should prevent it not just uh, solve it because this is a bad approach that we let these children lose their 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 opportunity and then realize then when then we need to 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 put a remedy. Instead, we have to prevent uh, 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 this to happen. And unfortunately, it's already happening. The numbers are are worrying. And and so uh, uh, the budgetary instrument and then the the council recommendation for the implementation uh, uh, framework. As it was reminded by you at the beginning, I've been probably the MEP, not for Italy, but for all the, the, the parliament and of all the groups that had most role for the youth guarantee in the sense that I, I work on all the files since the last mandate on the topic. And, and the youth guarantee that is in a way a project that we have seen ameliorating also through the, the discussion with the local administration with how uh, it was implemented locally. Uh, also, the child guarantee should take a similar approach in terms of uh, understanding the existing good practices that we have in place. Uh, we heard also some about that. 
um, uh, and to uh, try to replicate uh, uh, in the feasible ways, obviously with adaptation, the good practices that we already have and finance them and put them into a, a system. Uh, and also, uh, I want to underline how cities can be very uh, good in uh, uh, in uh, uh, through their uh, closeness to the people, we can say the administrations to um, also uh, uh, detail better what kind of child poverty is uh, uh, is in place because we have been stressing the fact that we have different dimensions of child poverty uh, regarding housing regarding uh, access to health regarding nutrition regarding uh, the uh, general uh, um, uh, well-being and we we know that also in the richer uh, uh, cities we have uh, situations where on one of those aspects uh, there might be uh, a special need think of housing for example which is uh, a, a topic of extreme relevance now also at the general uh, level in the debate uh, in fact with euro cities we discussed already a lot of times about this topic also not not just about children so to conclude i think that the um, the cities can be very good in in identifying uh, the uh, local concrete needs in terms of how we uh, actually uh, confront this child poverty because what we have seen to, until today is that very general and not focused and not tailor-made policies to fight child poverty that are the ones we had until now were not successful because we have numbers that are appalling in terms of child poverty all over Europe. So I think this is a, a new chance but to make it effective, we need also the help of the local governments that have the real grip of uh, phenomena that happen on the on the uh, real lives of of, of of people. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brando. I think I think you pointed out one important thing. I mean, lots of of course, but one that stuck with me is about that there's no acceptable level for child poverty. So I mean, we have in other areas. Talking, have been talking about zero tolerance. And I think this is an area where we really need to have a zero tolerance approach. We don't want any child poverty. It's not about getting it down, it's about getting rid of it. And also thanks a lot for connecting the local level to the European in, in two ways, as I understood it. One is to give the examples that we are sharing here and elsewhere to identify what are concrete needs and what are good examples that can be replicated. And then also to uh, receive um, and get access to funding that is needed uh, to do the work on the ground. And since we have a colleague from you from the European Parliament, Dragos Pistaru, with us as well, uh, I would like to hear your views after you have heard cities talking and also your, your fellow MEP. Uh, so what is what is your takeaway so far from our discussion and from what from your work also in uh, the intergroup on, on children's rights uh, about the, these different roles of cities and city governments and the European Union and the upcoming EU child guarantee. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much and good morning, Ivo. Um, hello, uh, everyone. Thank you very much, your cities, for allowing this to happen. Uh, I'm really enthusiastic about this topic and I, I really believe we are at a historical momentum right now to, to actually push through and have a breakthrough related to poverty, uh, to fighting poverty and to fighting uh, child poverty especially. I would also would like to, um, you know, um, thank and congratulate Brando for hosting today's debate. Uh, Brando, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. I hope that we are going to uh, work together soon on the child guarantee. And um, I think that we can all bring really good ideas in the debate. Let me just explain how am I right now uh, you know, trying to be a champion on, on this particular agenda. I've been Minister of Labor and Social Affairs in Romania in 2016. And um, while I was aware about, you know, statistics and things as an economist, researcher, professor, um, I used a lot of time actually to travel <laughs> that year and to go on the field and to see that poverty is not only in rural remote areas, but also in you know, really close neighborhoods of big cities. Um, and, you know, these things and seeing seeing the fact that 
um, we are more or less banning the access and opportunities for children and youth. Um, and thus, you know, going in this vicious generational cycle, uh, while we were, you know, sheltered in a, you know, Tour d'Ivoire, you know, in an ivory tower in, you know, making policy, that for me was basically unacceptable. Um, I have four children of my own, and that's also a very important uh, um, aspect. So I'm, you know, not uh, just talking, but walking the talk back home, uh, and especially during the pandemics, everyone with you, of you that have kids, you know what I'm talking about. So I can just only imagine if for me it was difficult, how difficult it was for those that are in difficulty or in deprivation. So that's actually, you know, some of the energy that I have within me on this particular topic. Now, very briefly, um, just to give a little bit of background, as Brando is actually the champion and, you know, deserves to be congratulated on ESF+, my agenda was basically through an immense opportunity on the RRF, Recovery and Resilience Facility. And I was initially on the previous file called Reform Support Program, and once we've been uh, you know, plunging into the pandemics, I came out uh, together with some other colleagues with the idea that we need the bazooka, so then we have the RRF. And then to my dismal, um, I mean, when I've seen the first version of what was the most important part of the new generation, next generation EU, I was actually struck by the fact that the world children or child is not there. I mean, dear colleagues, there was no reference whatsoever in the initial version of the commission about children. There was only one mention about youth, and that was in the digital methodology tracking. So, I mean, you can just imagine, um, you know, the shock I had when starting, you know, consultations in 13 member states and so on. I've, I've met, you know, youth uh, organizations and so on. Then they were asking me about the subject and I was actually trying to explain that there is no mention of that. So then from that, I actually started on a pledge on my own and a crusade convincing first my group, then the parliament and then convincing the council in the co-decision process. And right now what we have is a pillar a fully-fledged pillar for children and youth with clear mentions in the recitals about the child guarantee and the youth guarantee. Obviously, I wanted more. <laughs> and Brandon knows that because we were actually having the same agenda. We wanted earmarking. That is a minimum of 7% allocated to that to be sure that resources will be there. Now, for the sake of flexibility, this didn't happen, but we have a pillar. And right now, all the member states that have not included in the draft versions in October, November, anything about that, right now they are re redoing their plans, including things for children and youth. So, so that's actually one thing. And I will be then in the monitoring, and obviously I will stay with the scrutiny rights together with Brando and my colleagues to be sure that the plans are well, well done on that. Now, we also introduced actually consultations with stakeholders, including local and regional authorities. So if you see right now in the regulation that, I mean, it could have been even better, you know, with a year mark amount for uh, local authorities, that was not possible, but we have the consultations there. And, you know, very many member states that have not consulted before local authorities, they are doing it now. So these are actually two of the things that, that I've pushed for because of Eurocities, because of feedback that I got from mayors across Europe because of um, feedback that I got from stakeholders, generally speaking. Now, let me let me go to the, you know, to the more profound depth of that. We have right now several rifts, major rifts in EU policy related to child guarantee. First rift, it's about public versus private. I mean, we have this, this, this thing that fighting poverty, it's a public thing. And the public agenda should come with, and it's public, you know, that it needs to be doing things, you know. And, and, and I think that we are actually, you know, wrong in that. What we need to do is to be sure that the public sector, the civil society, the private sector, we have right now the social impact investment uh, models that are blooming. We have InvestEU with the social window. So we need to put that together. So what, what's, what's in it for, for the cities? But the cities should actually say that this is not only our job as mayors, um, you know, with the money in the public budget. I've heard the mayor of Ljubljana and I was so glad and, and grateful for what he's doing. But the main thing is to say this is not something that is done just by public policy. It should be done by everyone. This concerns every one of us. Of course, tax money is doing part of the thing. 
but we should actually embark upon with you know corporates, with entrepreneurs, with social entrepreneurs, with civil society on that. Second rift, central versus local. I mean, you know about that. You know, this is this tendency at the central level to say we are coming with national programs solving anything and so on, while subsidiarity teaches us that the best way of intervening is local. We're still having troubles um, in terms of accommodating the fact that it's not central versus local, it should be central plus local. The third rift is national versus EU. Now, you will all hear that on the issue of fighting poverty, this is not an EU competence. This is a national competence. But I mean, this is kind of really stupid. Sorry for my blunt language, because you will not be able to deal with, you know, the labor market in the EU and to deal with, you know, general demographics that are affecting, you know, economic development or other areas that are EU competence without dealing with the most important part, that is human capital. And you will not deal with human capital if you are not having an inclusive society, because that means that this will not be, I'm using, I'm using an economic argument, Pareto Optimo. If you have, for instance, in my country, one in three people that are in deprivation and poverty and outside the economic sector, then basically this is, you know, unoptimal. And I'm coming to the last rift. And I think that this is really, really nice. And, and I, I really believe that, that if we do that, we will be on a very good track. There are two main ways of thinking about poverty and about children, generally speaking. One is the one that Brando is championing. And it's about children's rights. And I really believe that it is about rights. In a Europe that believes in values, in the social pillar and, and so on, it is the rights of the children to actually have access and opportunity. But on the other hand, and a little bit on a different part of the political spectrum, this is something that I am actually championing a lot, that investing in children, it's an investment. You know, taking care of our children, it's a, you know, one of the best possible investments in terms of multiples. For those of one that have economic logic, this is better than technology startups. There are studies showing that if you invest in early childhood until 14 years old, the multiple is beyond tenfold. So you are actually getting somehow 10 more money if you are investing in prevention or in early education or in you know, nutrition or housing and so on. And this is decreasing the bill in the health sector, education sector, labor, um, active uh, measures and so on. So, so what I'm trying to say right now, and I will be working with Brando on that, is that we have a common cause that is neutral politically. Rights and investment, regardless how you see it, it is worth investment in children, investing in children. And it's worth investing it at national level, at EU level, at local level. It's actually bringing more advantages, you know, up to tenfold more money if you are actually concerned about budgets than that. And that's why there is a breakthrough right now that I think that went a little bit under the radar in the RRF. And I think that this is one of the biggest achievements that I've actually been working on. We will have a social expenditure tracking that will allow us to define what kind of, you know, social, um, social expenditure we can, we can actually name as investment. Because the RRF is about reforms and investments. And if we have a social tracking on investment, then we can actually go at our budget colleagues in the Ministry of Finance or, you know, the Treasury part of our local authority and say, this is not expenditure, this is investment. And if we are recreating the narrative from an economic standpoint and financial standpoint, that when we ask about, you know, money for vulnerable people and children and youth, then basically it's about investing in things that have a return on society and not just spending money. I mean, and as a minister of labor going and begging at the Ministry of Finance when I was a minister, I know what I'm talking about. So the point is that if we manage to do that and explain that social investment is investment as it is economic investment, I mean, we are really, really on a good track. I mean, I've actually expanded too long. I'm really excited to what I'm hearing. I've actually put you on the table four things to reflect. I think that this is an historical moment. We have ESF Plus, we have the RRF, and I'm, I mean, I'm really excited that with the child guarantee and with the Portuguese presidency and with the commission, and we are going to hear from Santin and from, I mean, representing also Commissioner Schmidt, very dedicated to the topic. We are on a good track. So let's stick together and, you know, make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dragos. Uh, also for highlighting that it's not in the European Parliament, it's not one political group 
versus the other, because Brando and you, you are from two different political groups and we can see you are joining forces here as well. And also for highlighting the need of joining forces, as we heard from the city examples, actually, public and private. So to get local pacts against uh, child poverty together, and that is including all actors, civil society, companies and uh, the public sector. But now, uh, Santina, you have been listening a lot, and I think that's maybe a bit typical for the role of the European Commission, as you're part of the cabinet of uh, Commissioner Schmidt, because you will get all these people knocking on your door. You have Eurocities, uh, you have uh, the Parliament, you have all groups that uh, come up and say, we need this and you need to fix that. And now the ball is a bit in your field, because you have been picking up the idea of the EU child guarantee, You've been listening not only today, of course, but over a long period to get all the necessary input. And now you're preparing your response, a proposal for the EU child guarantee. So maybe you could give us a bit of a sneak preview and also reflect on what you've heard today, how this ties into your work and what lessons you learn from those local initiatives for the design of the EU child guarantee. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, it was, uh, it's really um, sweet music to my ears to have uh, the possibility to listen to uh, such uh, a very strong and harmonious approach from all the levels. So the local levels, um, European Parliament, uh, the Portuguese presidency on which we very much count, and listening and looking at all the experiences you've been putting forward, I have read with interest the studies, which is also very helpful, that you have produced, a, and also I know that you have cooperated with the Commission in, your, in, uh, in, in going and looking for your findings. And I think that this is the, the good way to work and tackle a, a huge problem as child poverty. I, um, before telling you uh, what direction we are taking, and we are not uh, going maybe to surprise you because we have really listened to the requests of the stakeholders, uh, we have really listened to the request of the parliament, and you'll see that. I would like to make a, a general comment that I uh, perfectly, uh, I'm perfectly in line with those before me, like Brandon and Drago said that. Um, there is a, a macro, a macro um, picture we have to look at, and this macro picture push us uh, to deal with uh, the child poverty and child inequalities, either for a, a, um, from a point of view of social fairness and uh, from a point of view of uh, competitiveness and of our economies and our societies. And so, uh, with the view of these um, broad approach, uh, it is very important that we take policies, funding, and governance at the same time in the same basket, and that we set the ambition uh, for uh, really tackling child poverty. Now, um, you, you asked me, Ivo, what, uh, what uh, I have drawn as a lesson to listening to you. The lessons we have learned from these events and from, um, and from many others that we have uh, participated also as a commission to which Commissioner Schmidt has participated, has really uh, reinforced our conviction that the territorial dimension uh, with regard to child poverty or poverty in general is very important. It's very important because, uh, well, the local reality, the local authorities are those who really see and have to give the prompt and immediate reply to uh, to child poverty. And I think that the concept also of partnership, of, um, of integrated approach, a multidisciplinary approach that we also take in our in our uh, in our upcoming proposal is is, is the is the, um, the the working method which is most effective in in the experiences you've been putting forward, and we will uh, take up this, this approach. Um, while I stress that we very much concur that the territorial dimension is important, is because you'll see in the approach we take, uh, we very much put the focus on a scope which is the one of the children in need because uh, we want to tackle the circle of, of, of poverty, the intergenerational cycle of poverty, uh, which is particularly um, yeah, keeping our societies 
uh, backward and is a, is a source of, of uh, uh, intolerable uh, injustice because uh, the poverty should not be tolerated, but what cannot be tolerated is that uh, child poverty is higher than, than the general level of poverty. And this is a double uh, level of injustices that children shouldn't, uh, shouldn't bear. And that's why I, um, the approach uh, combining the territorial and, and, and the general is important for us. But we have also heard and listened to your call in saying that cities and you are representing cities but it's the same for rural realities cannot afford being on the front line alone they need a co coherent national approach uh, from all member states those uh, who already have uh, oh, those who already have a relatively good situations but also especially those who start now preparing plans and uh, addressing the child poverty issue um, that's why uh, in our approach, we will target children in need, we will define the services to which effective and free of access should be guaranteed, we define uh, how member states will be called upon in targeting and mapping the children in need. In this exercise of mapping and outreach, the local and uh, the local authority, the local stakeholders will play a key role. And here it's a very important focus in our approach because uh, um, even where um, we have a provision of services, where we have strategies or policies tackling, uh, tackling children, some we have a problem also of outreach and take up of services. Therefore, here the cooperation between the national and the local is very important. And we will put a, a strong accent on, on, on this aspect. Now, um, so this is what I have learned as the lessons you ask, Ivo, how this territorial dimension will be taken up. We will ask member states to put forward national plans, and this would be done, will have to be done in close cooperation with local actors. We put uh, a strong importance in the action here in the commission and my commission also to the social economy and social entrepreneurship, because social economy is also an actor which play an important role. Now, but we are not taking the, our fight against child poverty in isolation. We are working, uh, and you know very well that um, we will be coming out very soon on the 3rd of March uh, with uh, uh, an ambition action plan for the implementation of the um, pillar of social rights. And there um, uh, we will have this general enabling framework, which is necessary to tackle child poverty, because many of you already underlined that we need a specific strategy for child poverty. We need targeted measures. We need specific governance. We need involvement and partnership. But nothing will be possible if we don't have a general enabling policy framework, which goes from policy related to active labor market, wage policies, adequate income policies and housing policies. Housing is, is playing such a huge uh, role in, 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 in creating poverty, uh, in creating household poverty, because uh, as, you, as we uh, all, all say and repeat, there are no child, po uh, child poverty or ch poor children alone, there are poor families. So for us, this uh, approach in fighting inequalities and poverty with an enabling framework is very much important. And here, really, what Brando and Drago said with regard to existing financing tools is of paramount importance, because now we have uh, we have the conditions which are necessary. We have broad policy uh, framework available. We have different financing tools. We have the bazooka, the IRF, and we are very much glad that parliament helped reinforcing the social dimension in the IRF. We have tried from the beginning, from our side, we managed to include the general social dimension, a strong boost for job creation, because this is important. We will have poverty and child poverty if, if unemployment will grow, and unfortunately it will. But parliament has been really uh, pushing uh, in, this, uh, in this common uh, fight, as far as we are concerned, this cabinet in having a clear pillar for social um, measures and for children and youth measures. And now we have to continue this work on the Delegated Act uh, on the social uh, spending, because we might not have specific tagging, but we want a clear monitoring of the social spending guiding member state action. 
these key enabling conditions cannot be forgotten. And that's why the child guarantee comes with the action plan for the implementation of the pillar, because otherwise uh, we, we, we will be uh, only partial in, in our approach. And uh, in this general approach, of course, the local, the local dimensions and the cities and the rural uh, areas will play a role. We will have this uh, need of developing uh, local partnership also for implementing uh, the, uh, the pillar. And that's uh, also uh, a fact that uh, we, we put very much uh, attention to the local dimension. We know that we have launched, uh, this was mm, based of course on the request of European Parliament, also our cooperation with UNICEF for the preparatory action for the child guarantee. So we'll come with the proposal for the child guarantee, but at the same time, the preparatory action of mm, coordinated by UNICEF and, and the commission in certain member states selected like uh, uh, Bulgaria, Croatia, Italy and Greece and other member states where we uh, have uh, approach in helping developing national plans, and that's for Spain, for Lithuania, um, and even for Germany, will also guide and inform because we all need to build on good practices and best practices. So we uh, we uh, we work on the micro. We put together the different forms uh, of measures and financing that we have at our disposal. And in this regard, I open as more in brackets. Let's not forget React EU. You you, all, you have stress DSF plus. You have stress RRF. This is true. But we have React EU, and the React EU is immediately available. And in the programming of the React EU, I really plead. Because for you also at, at a local level to push with your uh, regional and, no, and, and national programming authorities to take into account investment for children, because investment for children, I can tell, is the best investment we can put forward. So this is, a, is our broad scope uh, of action. We plan to be uh, out uh, with the child guarantee immediately after the action plan uh, on the pillar, which will contain a set of important deliverables, which will help also tackle uh, poverty in general and inequalities, because uh, inequalities are really putting a break in our uh, potential for catching up and using this, this recovered this recover these opportunities to build ba uh, back better and therefore um, on, uh, we will be uh, coming forward with the recommendation as you said we followed your indications the request was up to have a council recommendation and that will be the tool at the end of march on the 24th of march and uh, we really also hope that uh, based on your push based on the engagement of the um, portuguese presidency uh, member states will really swiftly work at these recommendations. The Commission stands ready to cooperate, to improve where necessary, and to support. But it's very important that member states, once the proposal is there, really focus on the finalization of the recommendations of the child on the child guarantee. We know that we have this very important appointment in Porto, and. Um, portal will take place uh, in May and uh, what we will hope for is that we will have a fully fledged operational guarantee adopted under the Portuguese presidency and following to which member states will be required to draw national plans. And it is important that preparing national plans for the child guarantee goes together with the definition and implementation of the recovery uh, plans that the member states will put forward. Therefore, timing is also very much important. I'll stop here because I have been speaking too much and I still thank you, I want to, uh, to thank you for your input and we will keep a close eyes on the experiences you are developing and Commissioner Schmidt is very much uh, enthusiastic of uh, the effort that all of you are putting in these common enterprises and always available to help to listen and participate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Santina. No problem that you have speaking much because you also have been listening much, as we can see from your response, because you're really reflecting well on what has been said here and also outside this conference before. Uh, it's, I think it's really encouraging to see that we are all on the same page when it comes to uh, priorities and timing uh, of this initiative. So it's uh, uh, we are already representing lots of the important actors in this process here, not only in the policy making, but also in the work on the local level. Uh, so today this round is connecting many of those dots that needs to be connected and it's really great to see that we are not coming from completely different angles but it's the opposite we are all together already and share 
very much the view of what is important, what needs to be done and how it should be done. So I think that's really encouraging to see. And we have been having, I, I think, about 10 or 12 speakers online here, but we have many more, 10 times more, joining this call this morning. And as we said in the beginning and already can see happening in the chat, this is an open debate. So we also would invite others that are joining to share their views. We have seen some comments on like, is a minimum income a good policy tool that could help to fight family and child poverty and some other topics that have been raised. And Bianca, my colleague, I know you have been monitoring the chat conversation closely. Anything you want to pick up from there? Thank you, Ivo, and thank you for, for the interesting debates. Yes, there is also a debate in the chat box. Uh, we see uh, Barcelona and Glasgow sharing about the minimum income and the importance of the minimum income as policy to, to prevent and tackle poverty and child poverty as well. And also there is one question for the panel that uh, comes from uh, Marie Genevieve Mounier from France. It's about um, what support is there under the child guarantee on isolated homeless children and with their parents. So it's about uh, yeah, homelessness. And I think we also have uh, indeed a colleague from Zagreb, uh, Romana Galic, uh, that has something to share from Zagreb, if Zagreb is connected. Hello. Hello, Hello. dear colleagues and representatives of the EuroCities Network. Uh, as you heard, my name is uh, Romana Galic and I'm the head of the city office for social protection and the people with uh, disabilities. And I'm very glad to be able to present you briefly today the activities of the city of Zagreb in order to fight child poverty. Uh, we direct our policies in accordance with the national and the European strategic frameworks. And we are proud that in the context of the European pillar of social rights, we have a new city pledge which supports the principles first education training and lifelong learning and 11 child care and support for children aimed at supporting children and young people to realize their personal potential and protect poor children as i said in our city office that I'm head of, in addition to providing appropriate care to citizens of all ages, through the social program focused on caring for children coming from low income families. Some of the measures we are implementing are helping food and hygiene supplies packages for families with three or more children, help with daily food, summer holidays, and many others. City of Zagreb also provides scholarships, which are recognized as a good example or example of good practice, both for other local communities and beyond and beyond. We co-financing kindergartens, meals and schools, free textbooks and other educational materials, a free ticket for public city transport for pupils and students. Also in the city of Zagreb, we finance programs and projects of association in the field of social protection. We are aware that finances stand behind all these activities, initiatives and measures. Annually, the city of Zagreb allocates about 10% of total budget for all measures and activities aimed at the fight child poverty. I believe you know that during 2020, the city of Zagreb was affected not only by the crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, but also the consequences of the, the devastating earthquakes, which directed us even more to raising funds from the available EU funds. Accordingly, and in the con connection with your previous presentation, I would ask you to explain the possibility of financial support from the EU program of the future financial period, 
which cities will be able to use in fighting against child poverty as a complement to activities and which cities regularly implement. Thank you for your attention and thank you for your answer for my question. Thank you very much, Romana. Do we have more from the chat that we should take up, Bianca, you think, here? Yes, I don't see any more questions, just uh, very nice uh, comments, also from Warsaw, the importance of equal access to childcare services for all, which is very important for all children to have access. Again, the issue of, of housing and homelessness. So all parts that are um, services under the child guarantee. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, yes, I think uh, if colleagues have more questions, uh, please uh, raise them in the chat. If not, we can go back to the panel. Yeah, and back to the panel would be a bit for, for the final round to then also go back to the cities because we started with, from cities and what's happening on the local level in terms of identified needs and action and then also bringing it up to the European level to see what support, what response can come from the EU. So maybe respond to what we've heard on that level to see what cities think about that. And maybe we could hear from, from you, Anna, in Milan. Uh, you've been the first city today speaking up and sharing what you have been doing so far and, and what your work priorities are. are. Now we are one and a half hours later. We have heard a lot of uh, ideas and insights and arguments. So what's your takeaway from this? Are there open questions? Will this support your work in Milan as you need it? Or how do you see this? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, just for some words. I think that it's very important um, that uh, uh, European Commission have passed by investing investing in quality of early childhood education and care services and enable a local approach, for instance, to fight segregation. So to focus on quality of our services. First of all, to ensure quality, I want to stress the importance of staff training and on ratio between adult and child. And so it's very important to not to um, uh, to, to pay attention uh, on, on this aspect and you have to help us to focus our approach and our approach on this, uh, uh, on this quality. Uh, I think it's very important also to have beautiful buildings, infrastructures and green spaces. So we have a common approach um, based on training for uh, staff a very important uh, uh, attention on ratio adult and child, and then buildings, space, and infrastructures. So uh, your activity can help us not to forget these three aspects of our activity. The preventive role you mentioned more than once of our services in terms of school dropout, on bullism, and so on, start from childhood from the very early ch childhood. And so it's very important to, um, to have the chance to build a different relation between children and cities, between children and the community, between children and all the people around them, developing a strong citizenship uh, and sense of belonging on that community I mentioned in the previous uh, speech. And so I think it's important to have a very uh, pragmatic approach, as I said before, but also a very high, uh, in, in some way, way of um, looking at our attention. And so local scheme uh, to fight child poverty uh, need to be spread out all over the cities in uh, uh, the suburban areas, but also in downtown and center, because you have to give opportunities to all children, uh, not just in the area in which you think about economical problems, but you have uh, the same approach, the same uh, attention in every uh, neighborhood of the city. 
Uh, we are working for a city we call Milan in 15 minutes cities, uh, avoiding uh, gate communities, avoiding ghettos, but uh, we want that every, uh, every uh, space in the city become familiar for every child. And so we want to have a network with all the spaces, with all the uh, opportunities that uh, we can uh, involve in our uh, culture approach. So, for instance, museums, uh, libraries, also some events can become spaces for children and families' participation, mutual recognition, and so a sort of identity process creation. So we have to focus on the middle, and I think that uh, your child guarantee can help to stress this important, to focus on the community and on the training, and to focus in spaces, in buildings, and in chance also to uh, keep in touch with all the chances of the cities. So these ingredients uh, can be European ingredients and can help uh, our cities not to forget to have them as focus. Thank you very much, Anna. Santina, I saw you nodding and taking notes, so uh, it, it, it has arrived, I think, <laughs> the messages, so that, that's good. So let's look into uh, another of the cities that we have in our panel, and that is Leeds. Uh, Salma, you're in a bit of a different situation, of course, with your country not being a part of the EU anymore, so you're not in the position to receive EU funding anymore. But still, Eurocities is bigger than the EU. That's what Bianca said also in the beginning. We talk about Europe and European cities. So, uh, of course, still happy to have you in our family and uh, sharing your good examples. What are your takeaways from what you heard from the debate today? Um, thank you. Um, so it's been a fascinating um, conversation and a debate and so much for me to take away. Um, but as you know, we, you know, we are still in, in the United Kingdom is currently still in a lockdown. Um, for us, our biggest challenge is going to be um, prioritising our children sort of almost like when we look post COVID um, and, and, and the impact I think we've all talked about um, you know, that we have had uh, with COVID. So for, from our point of view, whilst we are very much dealing with the pandemic at the moment, um, the, the key thing for us right now uh, at the moment is obviously schools are closed, but it's really important that we ensure that our disadvantaged children have access um, to free school meals, uh, to digital technology, and actually looking forward, particularly what I'm hearing, um, what is really an important priority for, for us as, as a city as well is to strengthen our approach um, in terms of mental and well-being of children uh, and young people. As Lanray said earlier in the debate that there are a lot of children that are very, very anxious uh, because of, of, of not knowing what's going to happen with the exams, um, you know, not being able to, to interact with, with their children. So for us, you know, our focus is going to, immediate focus is going to be on, on mental and well-being. We have, if I must, uh, may say, Leeds has also secured 2.9 million from the European Structural and Investment Funds to deliver employment support uh, for young people 15 from 15 to 24 year olds. Now this support is being tagged to over 1100 young uh, people in Leeds with poor mental health, including those with emotional, behavioral and social difficulties to secure training and work over the next three years. So I think for us, um, you know, the, the challenges is, is poverty challenges will always be there, but the immediate obviously challenges is the mental well-being of our children in the city who have gone through a lot um, but yeah, no, this, this, this conversation has been fascinating for me and I've taken so much away. So thank you for having Leeds. Thanks for being with us, uh, Sandra, today. And then finally to Madrid, uh, Santiago, what is your takeaway from our debate today and what's needed to be heard from Madrid at the end of our to discussion today? Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to, to, to stress, but perhaps more more I would say more to to re-emphasize or to summarize the messages that have been uh, provided already but I think that from Madrid agreeing with previous speakers we think that we need a um, holistic integrated support for families uh, it's not enough to focus on children in isolation from their parents but to support the whole family we need the support uh, to the whole family to break this we can call the intergenerational cycle of poverty. This is an important issue that we need to tackle. Uh, improving the situation of the children depends on improving the situation of the family, 
which may mean uh, getting out of debt, uh, helping parents to, to get a good job or getting uh, basic needs, of course, but getting the home heated, renovated or, or even connected to, to the Internet. Uh, so uh, and trained digitally in, in, in the whole family. Uh, so we also think that the child guarantee might uh, focus and is in fact focusing particularly on uh, prevention and early intervention to detect risk before it uh, translates, before it materializes into disadvantage. Uh, we, the cities, we think uh, that this is a very important prevention work. And in the cities, we think as well that we are very, in Madrid and other cities, we are very well positioned for this uh, important task through our social and educational services close, close to the, to the citizens. In these uh, lines and with this spirit, in Madrid in particular, we have recently, very recently approved the new local plan for children up to 2023, sorry, which includes 255 measures and that has been developed with participation of children for, for, from each of the 21 districts of the city of Madrid and which is funded with a budget of uh, 625 million euro for this four year uh, four year period. And I think this is uh, the direction we want to take the participatory, appro uh, participatory approach. We want to 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 bring together all the, the city, not just the municipality and to bring all these challenges all together in the next uh, already in the pandemic now, but in the next years as well. Thank you very much, Santiago. We see still comments coming up in the chat, like Marie Genevieve is uh, highlighting the need to uh, take uh, special care of homeless children, which seems to be a, a great issue in, in France. And I just want to point out this is not the end of the debate, obviously. We, we will still have a lot of discussions like this. We are at an important milestone here uh, regarding the EU child guarantee, but this will not stop us talking and identifying more needs but it's almost the end of today's conference, so we need to sum up and I would like two of our co-hosts uh, to do this. Dragos, you would have the first word for a short sum up uh, because we are co-hosting this together with the European Parliament for today's event. Dragos, please. Yes, um, I, I was delighted to, 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 to hear, and, and that's actually the most important thing. I was actually, you know, listening to a lot of, you know, really interesting things. And and for me to, to be able to take these takeaways, it's really important because, you know, there are layers, there are layers of information and best practices that can help me actually, you know, do what I'm supposed to do, have better legislation for European citizens. Um, it's actually really important that we've heard about solutions. Uh, and, and I think that, again, uh, my enthusiasm um, that I hope that it will actually uh, be perceived and, 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 and you know, taken upon uh, by every one of you. Um, it's also based on the fact that, that um, I really have this hope that together, uh, you know, listening to, to this kind of initiatives, we can uh, overcome poverty in Europe. Um, as a conclusion, I would just like to touch upon the issue of cooperation and coordination. I think that coordination, it will be actually key. We have a you know, multi-layering of programs, uh, of efforts done by EU, member states, local, regional actors. Um, and it will be really important to, to, to know, you know, more or less figure out how to, to, to build up this coordination. And, and I think that Eurocities has actually exactly this particular mandate to take that kind of information from the local side and you know to to, to be sure that there is awareness and coordination um with the with the eu policies and uh, i mean i just can't want to give you you know <laughs> one takeaway from my side related to you know what cities need to do in the in the next uh, you know years and i think i mean you you are all um you know uh, I've acquainted already with the with the with the buzzword smart city. I mean that's something that was uh, <laughs> you know talked about you know in the last policies of the EU, and I think that we have some sort of a smart city reloaded right now. And I think that that uh, you know being smart or having a city that would be smart in the next next uh, period of time would be how to use the different sources of information and funding you know, to actually deal with the objectives that we are talking about. And let me give you just two examples. We are at EU level right now talking about, you know, um, green transition and digital transformation. And if you think about it, you will say, I mean, this has nothing to do directly maybe with the child poverty. And I will actually, you know, argue exactly the opposite. 
that you may say directly that, uh, you know, um, the Green Deal is about the energy efficiency. It's about the renovation wave. And it's about right now giving another opportunity, another shot at housing and, you know, housing policies. And it's about, you know, dealing with energy poverty. So, so the idea is that under the apparent, you know, uh, guise of, you know, Green Deal, you can go directly to child poverty fighting. And if you take digital, I mean, digital divide, it's something that was written, you know, you know, decades ago about. So we right now have the chance of, you know, focusing on digital skills for children and on digital education. And this would actually, you know, give a tremendous opportunity for children to get out of poverty. So in a nutshell, oh, I mean, and, and health, I mean, health is right now because of the pandemics on the top agenda of budgets everywhere. I mean, preventions and access to health for children, that's, that's amazing right now if you manage to do that. So regardless of the fact that we may have, you know, dedicated funds for children in ESF plus or dedicated pillar in the RRF, we should use any bit of funding available to be sure that we have this integrated dimension with integrated community services, you know, um, that we can deliver. So I would actually end here saying that that would be my reloaded, you know, smart city approach. How to do that, you know, just to try to focus and be very agile um, on these particular issues. We should actually use these kind of networks as Euro, as Euro cities to share best practices and you know, more or less do the advocacy that it needs for this kind of intervention. The EU needs strong, healthy, vibrant cities with happy and healthy children if it's to prosper. And we united, it actually, we can actually deliver. I would like to thank Euro cities. Thank you, Brando, for the event today. And I look forward to our next talks, perhaps at an event that I'm hosting actually next week on the 25th with Commissioner Schmidt and with Minister Ana Gudinho for the Portuguese presidency. And also this would be on child guarantee. And thank you, cities, for, for attending that event. Um, um, uh, and I, I'm really delighted about that. So thank you very much for the invite. And I'm looking forward to working together on that. Thank you very much, Dragos. As we said, it's not the end of the debate. We will continue to talk. And your smart cities approach has already triggered some proposals in the chat, like smart child cities, so uh, to be continued. Final words for uh, Annette from Glasgow, our vice chair of the Social Affairs Forum of EuroCities. Annette, you're with us. Yes, yes, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, I'm still here. I've been listening intently. Um, and I think during all the conversations, as you've mentioned, um, I think we're all on the same page. We're quite clearly there's a commitment to eradicating child poverty and improving the life chances of our children. There's been so many great phrases said today. No one should be left behind. It takes a village. And as Lanra, our young person, said, level the playing field. Um, COVID-19, as we all know, has like shone a spotlight on pre-existing inequalities and of course it's deepened them and child poverty being one of them. And there's many analogies about this, but there's one here in Scotland that I think really rings true. We may all be in the same boat, but uh, we're, sorry, we may all be in the same storm, but we are all in different boats. And even then, too many of us are with no boat at all. Uh, and that, I think, really, in a nutshell, sums up how we need to tackle child poverty. Um, as has been mentioned, we need a holistic approach um, and we need to work vertically with the governments from the, the local, the national and EU level, horizontally working across all the co-production, the partners in our communities, whether that be teachers, social workers, health practitioners, the private, the public sector, we all have to work together and work cost effectively. Uh, yes, we need more money. Yes, we will be uh, thankful for more funding from the EU. Uh, however, we, we need to work cost effectively and do more with less as well. Uh, and just a few of the points that I've picked up. Um, Salma from Leeds have mentioned strengthening mental health supports, digital inclusion, uh, and as Dragos has just said uh, about smart cities, Glasgow also has that approach uh, and making sure the focus is on teaching our young people and indeed <laughs> everyone um, the focus on green and digital jobs for the future. Uh, we also have a sort of data and design-led targeting uh, and focusing on areas of poverty, sp uh, specifically free school meals and making sure there is an uptake with our kids. 
Um, there's been lots of comments on the chat, so as we've said, the conversation will keep going. I noticed one person said that children don't vote, and sometimes maybe that's why they're not mentioned in some policies. Uh, but as we've also heard, children are our future, so they will be the voters of the future, and they won't forget if we fail them. So uh, another thing that's said in Scotland, a report that's just out by the Scottish Government, if not now, when? So I think this is, we, we need to grasp the nettle and take this forward and let's all work together as one. Thank you very much, Annette. And thank you all for this very rich exchange that we had during those two hours. It has been recorded, the chat as well. So it will be shared with all of you. Whatever you want to revisit and check out uh, will be available for you. And also, of course, as Eurocities, we will continue to be part of this conversation. You can follow what we do, you can download the report and everything and see the city pledges when you just visit our website, the eurocities.eu site, and you find the links to all of that. I would also like to highlight one campaign that we are running now. It's the hashtag talk with cities campaign, because now is also the time to design the national recovery plans and to make sure cities input is included in those plans, which is not everywhere the case as we hear from cities and of course the work to support families and children is part of those plans so it needs to be part of the recovery planning on national and EU level so make your voice heard and we try to support you in your work with the national governments with this campaign with the talk with cities. So with this uh, thank you all for participating actively or passively in the conversation today uh, I think we're on a good path to prevent children of today to become a lost generation, but to build a better future, not only for children, but for all of us, because the children are our future. With this, thanks a lot for today. Have a good day. See you soon.